All right. So I am joined by Michael Sellers and Michael Cutlets. We'll, uh, we'll make it confusing and call you both Michael throughout this thing. Um, <laughs> but Michael Sellers, we'll start with you. You are the editor, director, producer. You're, you're the jack of all trades for Return to Hardwick. Uh, could you just yeah. kind of explain what that is? Well, first of all, I didn't really want all those jobs, but it ended up it ended up me just having all those jobs because mm-hmm. you kind of, you kind of have to understand that this is a veterans organization that produced this film. Okay. Um, it's a bunch of uh, World War II veterans and their families got together and they basically said, you know what, we've got photos, we've got films what can we do with this stuff? Like, where, where can we bring it to? And, you know, a lot of ideas came up for like a book, uh, maybe a small little video. Um, I mm-hmm. work in New York City in uh, production and TV and film. So it was sort of a natural thing for me to raise my hand and get a little more curious into it. Um, but yeah. they're, not a mo- they're not a movie studio. So mm-hmm. I kind of had to decide how much I was going to get involved and how much they were going to get involved. So really what they wanted to produce was a documentary about their group, the history of their group. um, And and I liked that idea. So I got involved. So that's what Return to Hardwick is, is a a documentary about a World War II group uh, that was stationed in England. Well, what's kind of fascinating is this is is your first beret into some of those roles. How, How did they contact you directly? How did you get involved specifically? That's another good question. Uh, My grandfather, which I always kind of lead into this now, is Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather was a 93rd bomb group member back during the war. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he was a bombardier navigator in a B-24 stationed in England for uh, six months. And he lived on the base, worked on the base, flew out of the base. And I'm sure he crossed his fingers every day, but survived 35 missions um, and returned home. Uh, in 1944. So through that, they had held reunions. Now mm-hmm. they've held bigger reunions and these are considered smaller group reunions. And one day he asked me if I wanted to go to a reunion with him. And I said, sure, no problem. So I went to one and I was amazed at what went on. I, I could not believe my grandfather was part of this history that I was learning this history. Yeah. So that's really where it started. And then I just started going to reunions with them and really following along and seeing what this was all about. So that's kind of how it all started. Did you, so a lot of the footage, did you end up taking a lot of the, like, did you end up making a lot of the footage or taking it with your own devices or did you kind of just compile what already was existed? Okay. That the way that happens is, and it's sort of, we merge together. Uh, they mm-hmm. did have, like I mentioned, archival photos and films. Um, but the idea was is that I wanted to, to kind of bring it to another level of what today's families are doing, second generation, third generation members. How are they involved with this group um, and, and on what scope it is? So the thing was is that they were doing a trip uh, to the actual base in 2015, and mm-hmm. they were going on – they call it like a mini reunion, but the mini reunion is taking members that want to go over to England and it's all prepared for them. It's all scheduled out and they, they go around the, the town of Norwich, um, which is sort of in the center lower section of England. Um, and it's in an area called East Anglia. Okay. And near, near there are tons of air bases back during the war. And one of them happens to be Hardwick. So I went on that trip and I thought it would be cool to merge the idea of the second and third generation members rediscovering the airbase along with the history of the airbase. So that's sort of where it came from. And uh, we'll, we'll bring you in, Michael Cudlitz. You, at what point did you get involved and, and how quickly did you say yes to this project? Uh, I got involved. I have a, we have a mutual friend. Uh, okay. There's an actual plane flying over here. Um, yeah. uh, that's perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, Michael, I, I don't know if it was a relative of his or an acquaintance of his. So he, he knows that side of it better. But I know that the, the godfather of my kids, uh, Perry Anzalotti, uh, he's an actor as well. And he used to work for, uh, did an ad campaign for uh, Nabisco. 
uh, he was the the uh, the snack wells guy um, back in the day. And uh, <laughs> basically, what happened was is that he, he Perry was approached by a friend of his who was either one of the producers or uh, somehow worked with the company with the advertising agency who was friends with Michael mm-hmm. and said, Hey, my, my buddy's doing this thing. And we were wondering if, you know, you could contact Michael cause he was in band of me, Michael, cause I was a band of brothers and he wanted to know if I would be interested in maybe helping out, maybe doing um, a little bit of uh, narration or, or they, he wasn't really sure. He was just sort of feeling it out. Cause I think at the time Michael was still just trying to throw stuff at the wall and see what was going right. to stick, how he was going to present the, the, yeah. you know, the, the documentary itself. And, what resources he had. And he, he was just sort of reaching out to see what, you know, what was going on and, and what his, uh, you know, resources would be. So I got the call from, or an email from Perry and said, Hey, my buddy's doing this thing. He's a friend of his. And, you know, they're wondering if you would be able to, to help out. And I was like, uh, what is it? He's like, well, it's a uh, it's about his, uh, uh, reunion or something with his grandfather. Or something. I'm like, yeah, man, He's like, what? He goes, do you, do you know? I go, no, I know, I know, I know, I know exactly where he's coming from. I don't know what he's doing, but have him get in touch with me. And mm-hmm. I'm in because it's like, this is what we did basically with Band of Brothers, uh, just at a huge, you know, multi million dollar scale of, you know, reenactment. We went, you know, you know, return to Hardwick. It could have been, you know, return to Bastogne. It's like we, we took the stories, we went back with the men, there were the interviews done, and everything was recreated. But it was, really to to honor the memory of these men um, through the looking glass of a specific unit, but really touching on universal themes that that, you know, stretch out for, you know, any of these bases. Hardwick could have been any that bomb group is is one of I don't know if it's hundreds, but one of many other Mm -hmm. bomb groups that have the same camaraderie, that have the same sort of togetherness and they banded together in their little group and nobody understands what they went through you know, specifically except those men that went through it with them. And they have yeah. all sort of to varying degrees kept in touch with each other over the years, because this is a, such a, an important, um, you know, and, and heavy shared experience. So I knew what he was doing in, mm-hmm. in, in essence. So uh, having gone through the band of brothers thing and having myself been a uh, participant in many of the reunions that the band of brothers men went through and then continuing on, with the, with the reunions that I do at my house with the Band of Brothers actors, um, I knew. So I was I was like, whatever I can do, uh, I'm in. I have no connection to these men other than knowing, you know, a similar story with a completely different group, um, but knowing that these stories are, are more than worth documenting and the family members... Uh, as well, yeah. you know, continue to to propagate these stories and to keep the memory of these of these men and, and in some cases women alive. So, yeah, that's that that's was my it. Whole connection to it. Um, but that being said, that having happened, and you know, then meeting Michael, and then you know, some of the members of the group, um, you wouldn't have it any other way. Just, yeah, uh, the thing the real. thing is, is that Michael doesn't really realize what he got involved with. <laughs> He, I mean, he know he did it for the right reasons, which of course the group and myself were happy. We were like, "What? Michael Cudlitz is going to get involved? This is awesome!" And we needed sort of a voice, and we needed somebody with notoriety. So Michael yeah. filled that. But you know, as a on a personal level with Michael, I know maybe behind the scenes, he at, once he saw the cut and once he saw his involvement, I think it 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 sort of elevated a little bit. Not that he mm-hmm. thought it was going to be you know, something that was going to be small and people were going to be interested in it, but it just, because of film festivals, because of some of the write-ups, because of people's interest in it, it sort of has elevated to another level. And we've sort of dragged Michael with us through film festivals and he's, he's attended a few and also some museum screenings and he's been awesome about it, uh, doing that and, and going to these, you know, Michael could have dropped off after a while and just said, hey, I did my part. Thank you. All right. See you later. But he didn't do that. So that that kind of shows you where Michael stands in this. And even all the way back, like he said, to his involvement with Band of Brothers. I mean, it's it's going through the years here now. And this is just another project that sort of represents that. Well, more so than than even Band of Brothers, I I was looking through your 
your list of, of film and, and show involvement, you are a police officer or related to the military in some way. How does that happen? I'm drawn that way. In the world <laughs> yeah. Of Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I just, uh, I mean, physically, I fit the bill of, uh, I think, what people in their mind's eye sort of go, what's a soldier? What's a, mm-hmm. uh, what's a, a cop? Um, I, I probably had not become an actor or gone into, into construction. Uh, I, I probably would have been in the service of some sort. Um, it comes naturally to me. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't ever say that I, I fully understand what these men and women go through, but mm-hmm. I got through a lot of training and I've gone through a lot of ride alongs and I've spent a lot of time with men and women in services and in service industry and law enforcement industry. And, um, uh, I know enough to know. how to respect the job. Mm-hmm. Um, I would never for a second say that I, I know what it's like to put my life on the line for someone or to, to watch, you know, my, my buddy die next to me, not even for a second, wouldn't even pretend. Um, but that being said, I have shared intimate stories with these men and women and they've given me sort of the, I don't know if you permission, if you will, to tell their stories. Um, and I, I love telling those stories and I think they're, they're incredibly human stories when you mm-hmm. get down to it. Uh, and just like with, uh, return to Hardwick, it's, you know, that that's one of the wonderful things that, you know, Michael, uh, in crafting his documentary. And I think that it, it sort of snuck up on him. If you hear him tell the story is that, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's a documentary, but it's like, it's got everything. It's got, you know, <laughs> excitement and it's got a yeah. love story and it's got, you know, things that make, you know, um, uh, things that make stories interesting. It has a great big mystery that's still ongoing of the law, you know, the plane and how did it go down and, you know, and how the technology's changed over the years and we're realizing other things and how facts come out way after the incident. Right. You sort of go, Oh, you know, the whole thing with the magneto switch and, you know, and all these things that, that you just sort of had had Michael not kept digging, uh, the story wouldn't be told, or maybe one person would know. You know, right. he's thinking, "Oh yeah, I remember that plane went down." But but he was able to tell the story. Mm-hmm. He was then connected to a relative who was still trying to put those pieces together, and then connected to a bigger group and answered other questions. And it it just it just sort of snowballs. And it was a similar situation with Band of Brothers. You know, as we were continued to film the men were talking and we would have conversations with the men and they would say, uh, they would give more information, more facts would come out and their member, something would trigger a memory. They're like, Oh yeah, I remember that. Something they didn't talk about in the book. You know, I remember mm-hmm. one specific incident we were talking about was when, uh, everybody went in to basically, uh, you know, report Sobel. Um, there, we were talking to the men and they were like, Oh yeah, I remember that meeting. It was so-and-so, so-and-so shifty, so-and-so Popeye. Wow. And they were like, Oh my God, though four of those guys aren't even supposed to work tomorrow and we're shooting that scene oh we wow got on, we got on the phone with the producers <laughs> and we're like hey we just heard and you know and they're like oh hang on they call up you know oh man Aaron hey you are you we need you in tomorrow okay I'm there boom just to stand there because oh, that was there. there. you guys hear me you know wow that's crazy yes we can hear you Eli oh, are, you, are you frozen did, did, yeah video pause for you I'm sorry I'm it not sure pause. It's pausing on. We can we can see you pause, but we can hear you in real time. Interesting. Yep. Okay. Well, you got you guys both froze for a second. I thought I wasn't sure where that yeah, happened. So we're still going on our side. We're still going. Okay, I'm I'm still here too. So that, this okay. is the uh, this go. is the, the, the fun thing for for video. Uh, yeah. You know, streaming. So, um, Michael Cutlets, you were telling about the is that when some of the men who were telling the story of when they went to turn in Sobel, and you said all of a sudden he. Something triggered in his mind, and he remembered he named every single person that was standing there. That, that's where I lost you. Yes, yes, and that and that is what happened. I think I think uh, Donnie was on a phone with uh, with Lipton, mm-hmm. uh, with Carwood, and um, I believe you know the story was recounted, or or it was Frank. He, he, you know, he was he was uh, talking to Garnier, and um, they were just 
talking about the incident and they're like oh yeah we're shooting what do you know they were like what are you doing tomorrow oh we're shooting the scene tomorrow when you're oh i remember that blah 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 and mm-hmm. they're like oh yeah and then popeye looked at me and they're like wait popeye you know we're looking through the script popeye's not in that yeah day. you know so shit we better get like you know who, who do you remember who was there and he would go through and there were a couple guys who were there who weren't there and then there were some who weren't and who were supposed to be so there's a little bit of shuffling oh and, man uh, you know we, we were uh, the point is we were we were always honing it to try to make it better and okay. to get closer to the truth um, as we could. And the and truth is tricky because truth it relies on memory and documentation and factual evidence. And when you don't have certain of those things, you're fully relying on memory. And yeah. memory is tricky because memory can be taught. Memory can be learned. Memory can be you can see a photo and be told a story about it a million times. And then 20 years later, you actually think that you were at that event. Mm-hmm. If it's something that's emotionally close to you, not, I'm not talking about random stuff from some other, other people, but things in your family, you get told enough and you see enough pictures of it. And you sort of start to create a memory of it. So a lot of these guys tell different stories. And then the only way you get the truth is when you get a bunch of them together. Yeah. They talk about it. And they're like, no, 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 that didn't happen. Like, no, didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. You got sick and you were drunk and then, oh, yeah. Shit. Yeah, you're right. Yes. You know, and, and then you slowly get this, you know, uh, you know, it boils down, you know, and all you're left with is, you know, things that are closer to right. the truth. Right. Closer. Right. Not, not always 100% true. Not always bad, on. Not always yeah. 100% true. Yeah. One thing you did uh, with, I, pro- I guess this would have been within the editing is you would show a shot of how the base looks now. You know, it's this farmland, the beautiful lush green. And then you would yeah. show where the buildings were. And then at one point you had one of those veterans walking and you were saying, OK, this is where this would have been. And then, like you said, it clicked in his oh, mind. He said, yeah. that's where the yeah. tower was. That's where yeah. Yeah. the, you know, the tent was. That's what, and, and it was, right. it was very, it was one of the most moving scenes, I think, because you could see it, it awakened like, those memories within his mind. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that edit actually, that specific scene is always in my mind, the halfway point of the film. I, I mm-hmm. did a lot of work up to get to that point and I didn't know quite where to use this, but you know, it's breaking the film down in all these sections and then, the sections rely on the characters, technically the characters that are in there. Mm-hmm. And in the documentary, we have Gail, whose parents were married at the at the base yes. on the base. Um, and then the, the other main character is John March, which Michael was talking about, where his uncle's plane crashed in the field. Mm-hmm. Um, so you then sort of have to know how to weave this up. And John March's story was due to come up, and. Leland Spencer was that veteran that you're talking about, and it was a perfect fit to then start John's story up again. And I just remember being on the the airfield and the runway at that point, and I said, well, I've got this great stuff. Let me see if I can make something out of it of Leland remembering. He yeah. actually – that actually sort of sparked a shot that was earlier in the film where it's sort of a drone shot up to – from present day to wartime. And uh-huh. there's a lot of like 3D uh, CGI simulation there. And the guy that worked with me actually put all those buildings exactly where they're supposed to be That's on the great. base. So, so those sort of merge. You saw that shot early, but then we go back to Leland. And yeah, he, I mean, even I was behind the cameras like, oh my gosh, this is great. Yeah. Here we have an oh. actual veteran. Yeah. From the 93rd talking to us and how privileged are we, you know, this group on this trip to be able to have him stand there. And also, you know, he's an older gentleman. Most of the time he stayed on the bus, believe it or not. But Mm. this time he actually was able to come out. He wanted to come out and he was happy. You could see it on camera that, you know, he said, I needed to stretch my legs, but now I'm seeing something. And, you know, that's great when the camera's rolling to get that stuff. Did you did you know a lot of those people before you started working on this as as like as a documentary project? Yeah, another good question. The answer would be yes and no. Okay. Um, some people, because I've been going to reunions for a while with my grandfather, people that even knew my grandfather. My grandfather has passed away since, but there was probably half of the group I knew, and mm-hmm. half that I didn't. One person in particular, which was Gail, that I mentioned, I didn't know at all. Wow. I met her on that trip. And in talking to her and seeing her at another reunion after that in the States, 
she kept telling me about these photos she has, these letters from her mother. You know, you start adding this stuff up and you're like, wait, this this could work. Yeah. And then when she lands it on me, you know, that her parents were married on the base. And I was like, all right, we're done. This is one of my focus, you know. And when you decide to do that, that's a lot of energy towards that. Mm-hmm. And I felt the story was strong enough to kind of go and investigate. And she lives near my parents in Missouri. So I was able to drive and see her and interview her a couple times and do some pickup shots. So it was really great. Uh, so now I do know Gail. And I knew no, yeah. pretty much everybody from that trip now, but I it was sort of half and half at the time. There were multiple scenes that I would say gave me chills. And one of those was when Gail went into the, that couple, that local couple's house that used to be the Church. chapel. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. one of the other ones that stood out, and this is, I guess, just speaks to how powerful it is to know exactly where something happened is when they were, going around in the forest and they found the specific yeah. spot where the, the, the tent would have been or the, the, the house for, the hut. for yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That those, uh, you know, the hut sort of locating and the woman in there is Mary. Mary wanted to find her father's yeah. hut. Mm-hmm. The, the backstory of that is kind of interesting because her father had visited a few times, obviously was there during the war and wrote about it a lot where he lived on the base and Mary, her, her, her father since passed away as well, but she was on this trip and she had mm-hmm. these letters and she had our historian on the trip as well. And it was sort of a situation where like, hey, can you guys help me find this spot? The hut may not be there, but maybe something would be left to kind of know where it's at. So that it's almost on the edge of do I put it in the film or not? Does it relate anyway? So I really had to kind of edit it down, but I made it fit in there because I thought it was pretty special. I mean, hey, we're tromping through the woods. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting visual there. Uh, but then the, the chapel also was interesting because and this is sort of behind the scenes sort of inside info. But that chapel was shot about three years later. Um, we oh, went okay. on the trip in 2015. Mm-hmm. But. I told Gail I don't have an ending for her story. I said, but I do know what the ending could be. And if I get to know the owners, they may let us in to the chapel that, uh, mm-hmm. that they got married. So that happened. I got to know the owners. They said, sure, come on. And Gail and I did sort of a solo trip. I put her in the same outfit and made oh. sure she looked somewhat <laughs> the same. Smart. And we sort of it's a little bit of movie style there but Mm -hmm. essentially her getting into that chapel uh there is not going to happen in 2015 we were moving quick it was only a three-day trip everything was scheduled so i made it look like we kind of took a little diversion and went off to this chapel but in essence we shot it a few years later you also had a really fantastic shot of george young he was like sitting up on the hay bale with his camera and he was just sharing from his heart. And I thought that was another one of the most powerful scenes because these people really do look at one another as a family. And that's that's cool that you get as a storyteller, you got to be a part of that. I think so. In fact, uh, Michael was at a screening, one of our first screenings at the Mighty Eighth Air Force Museum in Savannah about this time last year. Mm -hmm. Um, And he got to meet some of the people from the group some of the family members. He met my father, actually. So, you know, these are people that all get together during those group reunions and go. And yeah, George is one of them. George was actually, who I'm going to say back in 2013, he lived in Hartford, uh, Connecticut, and we ha- happened to have a reunion that was close. He had mm-hmm. always seen, gotten the newsletter. He's seen the website, but he never wanted to make that commitment to go like across the country and then yeah. show up with a bunch of strangers. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So this one just happened to be in his backyard and George showed up and he he got hooked. He spent the entire three days with us in Hartford. We really do a nice setup at a hotel. I mean, how better can you get his father passed away when he was young? Mm-hmm. So he never got to hear those stories. But here are veterans of the 93rd in the same group his father was in that he's able to hang out with. He was hooked. So every every time since then, he's been at a reunion, including the hardware trips. So it was natural for me. I knew George at that time. And just to follow him a little bit, you know, you kind of have to know where to swing your camera. 
And when I saw George up on the hay bales, uh, I know he can, he's not an overly emotional guy, but I know that Mm -hmm. he loved to talk about, this is a nice subject that he likes to talk about. And definitely his father's uh, experience during the war from what he knows and looking Mm -hmm. through some of his father's archives. So I didn't want to intrude, but I did want to be able to, to capture him up there because I thought he was just sort of reflecting a little bit. And, you know, George being the nice guy, he started talking. And, and I just stayed and I froze and, and let him do his thing. And then shortly after that, when he was finished, you know, I thanked him and then I walked and let him have his moment still. But yeah. those are tricky. But George was very nice in, in letting me capture that. Well, it was nice that you could capture it almost so naturally. How, how many documentaries, how many reality you know, television shows do you right. see where things like that are staged? And it really, I mean, it, it was a beautiful shot, but it, it really came across as natural. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. That's very nice. <laughs> uh, Michael Cudless, did you, have you got to go over there to, to uh, Norwich, I guess, that area and walk around? Not, well, not in relation to, um, uh, to this project, but mm-hmm. uh, Michael and I were talking and I was trying to figure out, and I never really, I think I may have looked just to, to see uh but i looked on a map and uh where our guys and band of brothers were uh stationed was not incredibly far okay from where this took place so it's in the sort of the same area um of england that um that that was used for these purposes um so i I forget because we were in hatfield uh okay we shot and yep but that where we shot it was close to where the thing was, but where the guys actually were, uh, I think when they first landed in a pottery, um, uh, I, I believe that they're, they're, they're really close. I mean, a lot of the stuff was staged in, in, you know, in, in different areas, but mm-hmm. like clusters, like you'd have a cluster, right. like a certain area of England was used. And then another area, it wasn't like there was peppered all over the place. It was right. there were three or four specific, um, regions that were kind of used for that i believe that was so they could control the airspace Mm -hmm. uh and 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 not you know not interfere with any commercial or any sort of stuff it was you know a good hour uh two hours out from the city so in connection with this project no but i was over there uh for band of brothers we shot for uh you know almost a year in england wow yeah it's good that you were be able um you were able to make those connections with a lot of the, the people who would be considered the cast of this. Um, did you, was there anything that stood out to you as, as, as narrator and getting to meet these people? Uh, this just a, uh, and, and this, and this is not intended to cheapen it. It's intended to, to bolster it. Um, there's a common theme with a lot of these families, uh, who are the children and the descendants Mm-hmm. Uh, family members of the vets um and it's it's one that for the longest time these men all they had were, were were each other and then as time went on some of them opened up in different ways and the war affected them in different ways over time and they shared these stories to different degrees but the common thing is that as more of these stories came out like band of brothers like the pacific like a lot of these documentaries that have been done uh, this is not a generation that is typical, uh, typically out there talking about their feelings, mm-hmm. uh, just yeah. something that they didn't do. You know, that didn't start about, you know, I think for soldiers and in, in wartime and people expressing their satisfaction or dissatisfaction until probably around Vietnam was when that was the first wave of that type of thing where you could come, where you came home and you could, you could express however, whatever your experience was mm-hmm. being expressed. And it wasn't necessarily following the party line of, you know, the war and we did our thing and it was good and because you had a war in, in this particular case where it was pretty cut and dry it was like a good versus evil we you know we we won yeah. <laughs> you know we defeated <laughs> evil as a world mm-hmm. uh, and then everybody came home and they were like yay congratulations forget all that here's a house here's a low interest loan you want to go back to school we'll retrain you get back in there let's go and everybody yeah like, yeah and so the, a lot of the trauma that these men and women went through was never dealt with. So you see over time, it starts to come out. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very therapeutic. I think it's very therapeutic for the families. Um, I think they, they start to really realize, oh, that's, that's why my dad 
never really had other close friends. Right. Because he watched his six closest buddies blow up in front of him. Yeah. And they take that with them and they buried it for so long, but it shaped who they were. And to hear these stories come out and to hear other people talk about, there is a, it's definitely um, like for Paul, uh, there's a, a, a very cathartic sort of thing I think that happens. And you, you, you may realize why your dad was distant or why he processed this in this way or, or, oh, he always found that to be important in life. And this is why. So it's, uh, I find it wonderful because it's really is a rediscovery you know, of these men and who they were and how they grew up and this just amazing shared experience. And it's, it, it can be, you know, swapped out for any unit. It, it's like the, 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 the yeah. specifics of a change, but the emotional impact and the, and the way it affects these men and their lives and their families, universal. Yeah. Right. A good, a really quick, I could add to that uh, something that I witnessed. We were actually at a screening at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. And Michael got a, he, Michael was with me on this screening. And it was really cool that he zipped up from Los Angeles and he got a text from somebody. He's like, oh, I think, I think one of the family, I don't know how exactly how you put it, but one of the family members is going to show up. And it was Tracy Compton. And immediately I could see how, it was immediate connection. Tracy showed up, her husband showed up. This is the daughter of Buck Compton, who was featured in Band of Brothers. And I could see it from a distance that even, what are we talking, 20 some years ago when Band of Brothers was released, maybe, maybe a little less, their connection, they probably hadn't seen each other for a while, but it was like, boom, they hugged, they talked. And, you know, that's sort of what Michael is talking about. She's the daughter of someone that went through something crazy and a crazy yeah. period of time. And, you know, the, the band of brothers series just sort of memorialized that in a way and through the film and through the series, they've made that connection. So I think that's a little bit of what Michael's talking about and he's, he's been through it time after time. So anything, the 93rd, same thing. I mean, that's what we do with our reunions. And that's what's a little bit told in the film as well. It and showed how me and the, the family members, you see it, like the, even the members of the organization who've met me, you know, I, I see how they look at me. And yeah. it, it's, it's interesting. It, it's like they're looking at someone it's like, oh, my God, you're helping to tell my dad's story. Yeah. Like you are immediately yeah. pulled in, you know, and it's wonderful. Yeah. You know, but you're immediately pulled into the family because you are helping to properly tell their story and share it in an honorable way and it's right. just every all of these projects are just done with love you know that that's the the, the main base that's ingredient it. in all of yeah. these and and that's and that's the common thing and it just it just binds us all yeah i think it really showed when in some of those scenes we talked about that that were powerful them discovering things it showed how the other members of the group were so excited you know, when when, when um, the woman who was looking for where her, her dad's hut was in the middle of the forest, when she found it, everyone else was kind of, hey, really? Oh, this is great. Like, and they kind of circled around her. And there were a couple of couple of moments like that that I feel like uh, it just goes to show you that something that happened so long ago has bound generations upon generations of people. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, if you want to go to a 93rd reunion, you're more than welcome because <laughs> it happens every year. Yeah. And, and, you know, union reunions across the country, uh, even um, internationally, people are doing it. And it is through the family members. And obviously, you know, we talk about the second. Now it's kind of being the, the third that are running things, the fourth, mm -hmm. fifth generation even to pop up. Uh, so so these are the people that keep it going. And it is it is like that big family. I know, you know, I've been a, a part of the 93rd for a while since my grandfather got got me involved in that that first reunion was in England and it was in 2001 wow. uh so to be exposed to that at that time um just coming out of college moving up to New York for the first time and just sort of starting my career uh that ended up being another slice of part of my life uh, of doing that so and again it's culminated um all the way to this film to what to what we're showing in there right so return to hardwick has I think you've already won seven awards for it, which is which is uh, exceptional, and you've got it set to digitally release June 9th. Uh, yeah. Anything else you want to plug for it? Uh, talk about uh, it. 
nothing really. I mean, the the festivals have been nice. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's nice when you you do a film and you know you're kind of just throwing it out there. You don't know if people want to watch it or not. Um, but the last sort of festival that, well, we're kind of allowed to go to because with the pandemic, it's right. kind of interesting. But we uh, did go to Sedona. Uh, and the Sedona International Film Festival, and that was great. Uh, And Michael went with me on that as well. Um, So it was nice to get that in a theater and have people see that. The transition over once sort of the the new year started after this screening has been towards digital release. And Mm -hmm. what happened was our distributor, Gravitas Ventures, picked up the film. So they have really taken it down their own path and the way they normally do things. So the film will be available June 9th. It'll be available on cable, satellite, and any other digital platform that you could probably log on to. Uh, DVD, Blu-ray. In fact, you can pre-order the DVD, Blu-ray at Amazon right now. And uh, on iTunes, you can pre-order the movie. But the official release will be June 9th. That's great. Michael Cudless, any other last thoughts you had about being a part of this project to return to Hardwick? Um, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm always excited to talk about the film uh, because I, I didn't have any expectations. Uh, you know, not, not low, not high, not anything. I was, it was something that I knew that initially was doing a favor to someone that I knew it would mean a lot to. And I knew what this subject matter means to the mm-hmm. family. So to see it fully realized the way that and what Michael has done with it and and what the you know the group has supported him through all this because it's like look these you know this is a, these are not they're not in the business of you know making money <laughs> you know it's not it's like so to 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 come up with the kind of money that it takes to do this just because of the actual things that need to be done in mm-hmm. making the film so far as yep. you know clearing photos and getting rights to things and and just paying licensing fees and that just the physical you know, mechanics of getting it done, it's expensive. And, yeah. you know, the group, you know, God love them. They, they just really trusted in Michael and they we're seeing the footage that they were getting and seeing what it could have been. And they had the vision, even as not being filmmakers, you know, the, the, the best thing you can do to an artist is, is get out of the way. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's hard when you're dealing with someone yeah. else's story, you know, mm-hmm. when you say, Hey, we, I want, you know, where I'm coming in to do this thing for you. Yeah. I have a, vested interest because my grandfather is you know connected and i'm obviously i'm approaching this with love uh i need a bunch of money yeah you know and it's sort of like uh okay yeah yeah here we go and there was never you know obviously they wanted him to be frugal and careful with it but there was never as far as i know there was never a point where it was just like you know no we're not doing that it was always uh, an ongoing discussion um it was a partnership um and and it i think it's you feel it in the film you know it's just really really proud of it i'm really proud for for michael um uh and for the organization to be able to have their story out there like you know a lot of these uh groups and um units are able to sort of you know stake their flag in the sense of being like we 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 got to tell our story you know, yeah. people people know and they can look and there's a place they can go for information. And if they want even more information, there are other resources in that resource that you can find to do a deeper dive. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm really proud to be part of, of projects like this that are doing work that needs to be done before it's too late to do it. Because yeah, right. these, all these projects have a ticking clock on them. Um, these men and these women just literally in, in five, six years will not be with us anymore the yeah. entire generation will have passed and once it's gone then it's only memories from secondhand stories and it's it's hard enough to get the, the truth out when you hear it firsthand yeah. apparently i'm turning into a fly meal right now <laughs> um, but yeah so no i'm just real real proud of everybody involved and uh, happy i could uh, be part of it yeah that's great well, so, so- Check out Return to Hardwick, uh, available digitally on June 9th. Thanks, Michael Sellers. Michael yeah. Cudlitz, the, the comfortable and uh, ever, ever relaxed <laughs> Michael Cudlitz. Exactly. <laughs> Thank appreciate you both. It, guys. Good to see you, Michael. Take care. Guys. All right. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thank you so much for, for joining us. No worries. I appreciate you. All right.